everyone. Welcome to part two of chapter seven. Today's lecture is going to be split into kind of two different topics. The first half of today's lecture will be on using intermolecular forces to determine physical properties of substances. The second half of our lecture will be all about heat flow and this thing called calorimetry. All right, let's go ahead and get going. So like I said, the first part of this lecture will be talking about intermolecular forces as they relate to physical properties. So our phys first physical property that we are going to look at is vapor pressure. So vapor pressure essentially is how likely a substance is to go into the gas phase. Whether it starts as a solid or a liquid, how likely is it to turn into a gas? Essentially, the way it plays out is the weaker the intermolecular forces, the more likely it is to be a gas. And I think that makes sense based on what we've learned about intermolecular forces so far. If we have something that has really strong intermolecular forces, like an ionic compound, those are really, really strong intermolecular forces, then it's going to have a very low vapor pressure because it is not likely to go into the gas phase. Whereas something with really weak intermolecular forces, let's say something that's nonpolar, that has only dispersion forces. If it has really weak intermolecular forces, that means it's going to be very likely to go into the gas phase because there's not a lot holding it together. So the weaker the intermolecular forces, the higher the vapor pressure, all right? Weak intermolecular forces, high vapor pressure because that substance is more likely to go into the gas phase if it has weak interactions holding it together. So right here, this says it doesn't matter how much of it you have. It doesn't matter if you have a little bit or a lot. It also doesn't matter the surface area, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, it just depends on the type of stuff, okay? Is your substance bonded together with ionic bonding? Then it's going to have a really low vapor pressure because it's likely to stay a solid. If something has really weak intermolecular forces, then it's going to have a high vapor pressure because it's more likely to be a gas. So again, it doesn't matter how much of it you have, it just matters what it is. Um, and then our vapor pressure increases with increasing temperature because as we input energy, those molecules start to kind of move around, right? And as they get more energy, they're more likely to break the intermolecular forces holding them together and go into the gas phase. So higher temperature is a higher vapor pressure, whereas a stronger intermolecular force would be a lower vapor pressure. So these pictures down here are all of a phase change called sublimation. This is from a gas, oops, sorry, a solid, my apologies, going directly to the gas phase. So the one on the right, those are naphthalene um, and those are mothballs. In the middle, it looks like we have some iodine and all the way to the left, that looks, or sorry, all the way to the right, this looks like carbon dioxide, okay? But all of these are a solid that goes directly to the gas phase. It's actually skipping the liquid phase, which is kind of interesting. Normally we think of something like, say ice. Ice would melt into water and then it would boil into steam, right? But these three substances, naphthalene, iodine, and, and carbon dioxide, they go directly from a solid to a gas, skipping the liquid phase. Um, and this is called sublimation, okay? So our new term that we're going to learn is volatile substances. All three of these are volatile substances. This means that they have really weak intermolecular forces between our molecules. So there's not a lot holding them together. And so that means they can have the ability to go from a solid to a gas at room temperature. So they evaporate really, really quickly. Therefore, they have very, very high vapor pressures. So a volatile substance just means it goes into the gas phase really easily. Therefore, it has a high vapor pressure. All right, let's do a practice problem. This says at negative 125 degrees Celsius, both of those two compounds there are solids. We need to figure out which compound has the lower vapor pressure at that temperature. So remember, when we think about vapor pressure, we need to think about the intermolecular forces holding it together. If it has low vapor pressure, that means it's going to have strong 
intermolecular forces, which we abbreviate as IMFs. Okay, so a low vapor pressure means it has strong intermolecular forces. So essentially, we need to figure out the intermolecular forces that are holding both of these solids together. The only way that we can do that is by drawing the Lewis structure. Okay, so here are our two Lewis structures. So if we look at the one on the left, the one that has three fluorines and the hydrogen, okay, remember that the carbon-hydrogen bond is nonpolar. But all of these fluorines are very electronegative. So they're all going to be a partial negative, and that carbon is going to be partial positive because all of those bonds are polar. If we draw the dipoles that go with these bonds, we can see that two of the dipoles cancel out. The one going left and right will cancel. But the one that goes down, that one's going to be left over. Therefore, this is polar. Okay. If we look at carbon disulfide, it also has polar bonds. However, if we look at the partial negatives and the partial positive, and we draw our dipoles, we will see that the polar bonds cancel out. These dipoles cancel, making this molecule nonpolar. Okay, so remember, vapor pressure is lower when we have really strong intermolecular forces. So looking at these, right, this one is going to have dipole-dipole interactions because it's polar. Whereas something nonpolar has only dispersion forces. Okay, so dipole-dipole interactions are going to be stronger than dispersion forces. Therefore, our one on the left is going to have a lower vapor pressure than the one on the right because it has stronger intermolecular forces. Okay, so that's what we're saying here. The one on the left is polar and has dipole-dipole forces, whereas the one on the right is nonpolar and only has dispersion forces. Therefore, the one with the stronger intermolecular forces, this one, has a lower vapor pressure. Okay? because it's less likely to go into the gas phase. All right, we can also use intermolecular forces to determine the physical properties of solids like melting points. Okay, So a melting point is just the temperature at which something melts. Like we learned, the melting point for water is zero degrees Celsius. That's when water melts. Okay, But these melting points are all related to intermolecular forces. If we have a strong intermolecular force, then they are going to melt at higher temperatures. Okay, so for example, let's compare sodium chloride and water. So like table salt and water. If we think about table salt, that's a solid at room temperature, whereas water is a liquid at room temperature. The reason for this is that table salt is an ionic compound, and therefore it has really strong intermolecular forces. So it's going to be a solid at room temperature. It's going to melt at a higher temperature. Whereas water has weaker intermolecular forces because it's a molecular compound. Even though it has hydrogen bonding, our molecular compounds are always going to have weaker intermolecular forces than our ionic compounds. Therefore, it melts at a lower temperature. Okay, so the same can be seen in this. Things with hydrogen bonding, like water, ammonia, and HF are all going to have really high melting points because they're held together by strong intermolecular forces. Whereas something like methane, which is CH4, that's a nonpolar molecule and it only has dispersion forces and it has a much lower melting point. So here, what I want you to know is the stronger the intermolecular force, the higher the melting point. So here's another good example, okay? Um, things like sodium chloride that are ionic compounds have very, very high melting points. Whereas something like helium, helium is a non-metal and it's a single element. Therefore, it only has dispersion forces. It has a really low melting point. So again, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the melting point. All right, here's another practice problem. This says place the following substances in order of increasing melting point. Remember, if it has strong intermolecular forces, it will have a high melting point. So what we need to do is figure out the intermolecular forces for each one of these 
and then we can place them in order. So go ahead, pause here, give this a go, and then come back when you're ready to see the answer. All right, so let's go over this. So again, the first thing that we need to do is figure out the intermolecular forces for each one of these. Remember, the stronger the intermolecular force, the higher the melting point. So let's take lithium chloride. Lithium chloride has a metal and a non-metal. Therefore, it's an ionic compound, and it's held together by ionic bonds. So these are really, really strong intermolecular forces, which means it's going to have a very, very high melting point. I want you to think ionic compounds, high melting points. Let's look at chlorine. Chlorine is a nonpolar molecule, so it's only going to be held together by dispersion forces. So really weak intermolecular forces. That's probably going to have a very, very low melting point. And then nitrogen trichloride is a molecular compound. So we need to go ahead and draw out the Lewis structure. It looks like this. Okay, so if we look at this, all of these chlorines are more electronegative than the nitrogen. So they're all going to get the partial negative and our nitrogen will get a partial positive. If we draw our dipoles here, we will see that two of our dipoles cancel out, the ones going left and right. However, the one that's going down doesn't cancel. That makes this molecule polar. And if it's polar, it's going to be held together by dipole-dipole interactions and also dispersion forces, but they're not super important. Okay, so now let's actually answer the question. Now that we've figured out all of the intermolecular forces. So it says to place them in order of increasing melting point. So that means lowest melting point to the highest melting point. Well, the lowest melting point will be the weakest intermolecular forces. So that'll be chlorine. Chlorine will have the lowest melting point because it only has dispersion forces. The next would be nitrogen trichloride because it has stronger intermolecular forces, but it's not as strong as lithium chloride, okay? So here's our order here. Chlorine, like I said, the weakest intermolecular forces, then nitrogen trichloride, then lithium chloride. So essentially it's nonpolar, then polar, then ionic. All right, now let's talk about boiling point. Our order of the boiling points is going to be exactly the same as the order of our melting points. We're still going to have the weakest intermolecular forces correspond to the lower boiling point and the stronger inter intermolecular forces will correspond to a higher melting point. But, or sorry, boiling point. But what is the boiling point anyways? Our definition, technical definition, um, is the temperature at which the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. Um, so that doesn't mean a lot to us right now. Um, but essentially, the boiling point is the temperature at which our substance can go from the liquid phase into the gas phase. Um, the, at this boiling point, remember, as we're putting in energy, right, we're heating our substance up, we're putting in energy. And as we put in energy, we start to move those molecules faster and faster and faster. And as they move faster and faster and faster and gain energy, they be they gain enough energy to completely overcome the attractive forces and become a gas. We are going to break all of the intermolecular forces to go into the gas phase. That's the boiling point, okay? How much energy does it take to break every single attraction and go into the gas phase? So again, the weaker the intermolecular forces, the less energy it's going to take to do that. So they will go into the gas phase at a lower temperature. Whereas stronger intermolecular forces, it's going to take more and more energy to break those attractions and send that molecule into the gas phase. So another physical property that we're going to talk about is viscosity. And you probably haven't heard of viscosity before. Maybe you have, but likely you haven't. Um, viscosity is a liquid's measure of how much it resists flowing. Um, I like to think of it as like if you if you get some syrup, let's say we're having pancakes and we get some syrup out of the pantry. 
So when you pour your syrup, you know how it pours out really, really slowly? Or like honey, right? It pours out really, really slowly. It is going, but it's going really slowly. That is because honey and syrup have a high viscosity. They have a high resistance to flow, okay? They would rather stay where they were than move, right? Um, so essentially the way it plays out is the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the viscosity because it's more difficult for these substances to kind of move away from each other. If they have strong intermolecular forces, they're going to want to stay in place and it's going to be harder for them to pour out and move past each other. So stronger intermolecular forces have a higher viscosity. In this example here, do you see that this has two places where it can hydrogen bond? And then this one has three places where it can hydrogen bond? Since this one has three opportunities to hydrogen bond, it will form stronger interactions and therefore have a higher viscosity than this one that only has two. All right, so another physical property that we're going to talk about is surface tension. So surface tension is defined as the resistance of a liquid to increase its surface area. Okay, so essentially what it is, um, is like this picture here. Um, if you have, let's say a car that you freshly waxed and you drop some water on the car, the water doesn't spread out. It actually kind of beads up and clumps together on the car. It looks really cool. Um, but that is because water has a high surface tension. It kind of comes together and forms these little balls. So what's happening is that um, the atoms on the surface or the molecules on the surface are actually attracted to the molecules that are inside this water droplet. And so it's pulling it all together. And so that's what it's saying here. It says a molecule at the surface of a liquid experiences a net pull either downward or inward into the liquid. And that pulling is known as surface tension. And it will allow it to kind of bead up like this. Okay. We also see that, like if you see these little water bugs, these water bugs look like they have the ability to walk on water. It's really cool. But essentially these water striders um, don't have enough force to break the surface tension of the water because the water molecule that they're standing on is attracted to a bunch of other water molecules. And so it's actually strong enough interactions that it can uphold that force from our water strider, which is kind of crazy. Okay. so. As we have stronger intermolecular forces, we are going to have a higher surface tension. It's going to be more likely to kind of bond to itself than to break the intermolecular forces. Another physical property that we're going to learn about today is called capillary action. Um, capillary action is defined as the spontaneous rise of liquid in a narrow tube. We see this all the time in lab when we are measuring liquids in a graduated cylinder. Remember, we have like this and we always say, okay, make sure you measure the volume from the bottom of the meniscus. But have you ever thought like, why is it curved anyways? Like, why isn't it flat in the first place? Um, essentially what happens is that our water molecules are more attracted to the glass in our uh, graduated cylinder than they are to each other. Isn't that crazy? So the water molecules are attracted to the glass and start climbing up the glass. That's why we're seeing this bending because the water molecules are actively trying to climb up the glass and that's called capillary action. So we have two new vocabulary terms and in addition to capillary action, we have cohesive forces and adhesive forces. The cohesive forces are going to be what holds all of the water molecules together. Those are cohesive forces. The adhesive forces are going to be between the water molecule and the glass. Okay, so cohesive are the water molecules to each other. Adhesive are the water molecules to the glass. And essentially the way it plays out is when these um, adhesive forces, right, between the water molecules and the glass are stronger than the cohesive forces between the water molecules, then the water molecules will travel up the glass and we'll see this curve here. We can also actually see capillary action kind of going the other way. So this is water. You'll see 
the bend in the meniscus, right? But look at this one. That's mercury. So if we were to measure out some mercury in lab, we're not going to. Mercury is toxic. Um, but if we were going to measure out some mercury, we would actually measure the mercury from the top of the meniscus. Isn't that strange? Well, here we're seeing that the cohesive forces between the mercury are stronger than the adhesive forces between the mercury and the glass. Kind of weird. So you'll see different shapes of the meniscus depending on how that substance interacts with the glass. All right, we covered a lot of physical properties right now. Go ahead and pause here and complete problems number two through four on the chapter seven lecture worksheet to get some practice with these physical properties. Once you're done, come back and we'll keep going. All right, now we are shifting gears and we are going to talk about energy and heat. Okay, so totally different topics. Now, let's first look at our technical definition for energy. Energy is the ability to produce heat or to do work. That's kind of a physics definition. In this class, we are not going to worry about doing work. We are simply going to look at energy as the ability to produce heat. That's really all that we're going to be concerned about in this class. Heat is going to be represented by the letter Q. I know that's weird, um, but the H's are already taken. A lowercase h is Planck's constant, and a capital H is enthalpy. So heat is represented by Q because we ran out of H's. Um, but when we talk about heat, we're talking about energy that's being transferred from one object to another because of a temperature difference between them. So I wanna be super clear here. You can have energy, right? Some days we have more energy than others, but you can have a set amount of energy, but you can't have heat. Heat is what we call energy when it moves. So if you have energy and you're losing some energy, you can lose the energy as heat, or you can gain energy as heat, but heat is what we call energy when it moves. And the reason that this energy is moving is because there's a temperature difference between two things. Um, so let's say, you know, we had an ice cube next to a fire. Okay, well that fire is going to warm up the ice cube. So the energy will move from the fire to the ice cube. It always goes from hot to cold because remember we're moving heat. We're not moving cold. There's, you know, we can't move cold. We can move heat though. So it's always gonna go from hot too cold. So sometimes people will think that heat and temperature are the same kind of thing and they'll use them interchangeably and they're not. Heat and temperature are really, really different concepts. So let's take a minute here and imagine two different beakers. Picture them in your head and they both have water in them. In each one of our waters or each one of our beakers, we are going to raise the temperature by 30 degrees Celsius. Okay, but let's say that our beakers had different amounts of water. Let's say that one of our beaker just had a little water and our other beaker had a lot of water. And we need to raise the temperature for each one of them by 30 degrees Celsius. Well, they're trying to reach the same temperature, but it's going to take a lot less energy to heat up that water than it will to heat up this water, right? So it's going to take more heat to heat up the beaker on the right than it will to heat up the beaker on the left, even though we're putting them both at 30 degrees Celsius. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure we were clear on that. All right, so when we're talking about heat flow today, we need to think about the law of conservation of energy. And essentially what it, what it states is that in any chemical or physical process, so essentially in any changes that we make, energy cannot be created or destroyed. If you lose energy, it has to be gained by something else. Or if you gain energy, it's because something else lost it, right? We have to account for all of the energy, essentially, in the universe, right? It's all already been created. We are just kind of moving it around. So essentially, all of our chemical reactions and all of our phase changes involve heat, Right? They're all going to have some heat transfer of some kind. 
everything we do in chemistry involves heat transfer. So they can do one of two things. They can either release heat or they can absorb heat. But we're always going to have a heat transfer pretty much every single time. Doesn't matter what we're doing. If we're doing a chemical reaction or we're doing a phase change or anything like that, we are going to have some heat moving around. If our heat is being lost by our system, then we call that exothermic. I like to think of it as exothermic because heat is exiting the system. So we get exothermic heats exiting the system. That's going to be a release of heat. So it's letting it go. Whereas the opposite, endothermic, is when something absorbs heat. Okay. Um, so again, I like to think of endothermic as it's taking in heat. Okay, so you can kind of hear it in the name. So if something is absorbing heat, we call that endothermic. If it's releasing heat, we call it exothermic. So let's think about us standing around a fire. So if we were going on a camping trip, we're standing around a campfire. If you are standing there and you are getting warmer, you are absorbing heat. So you are an endothermic process in this instance because you are taking in heat. It's endothermic, okay? But if you are taking in heat, it means something else lost heat, and that would be the fire, right? Our fire had heat exiting it. So our fire is being exothermic and we are being endothermic. Okay, so they're always going to happen in a pair. If something loses heat, then something else gains heat. That's that law of conservation of energy, right? That energy has to go somewhere. All right, let's go ahead and get some practice. Go ahead and pause here and complete problems number five through 12 on the chapter seven lecture worksheet. Once you're done, come back and we'll keep going. Alrighty, so since we've been talking about heat, and this is chemistry after all, we have to have a way to measure our heat. One of the common ways that you've likely learned to measure heat in your life is calories, right? This should look super familiar. Um, this is nutrition facts, they're printed on literally everything. Um, and the thing that most people care about is how many calories there are in something. And a lot of time we think about calories as, I don't know, weight loss, or you know, and how much we're eating, right? And the reason we care about it is because we eat food to give us energy, right? And so this is a measure of how much energy you are eating. And that's a little bit weird to think about it that way, but that's essentially what you're doing. Um, the technical definition of a calorie is the heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of pure water, one degree Celsius, okay? Um, but this is actually not the same calories that we use when we're talking about food. So when we're talking about food, we're actually talking about a kilocalorie with a capital C. Do you see this has a capital C here? Most times people think it's capital C because we're just capitalizing the first letter. But it's actually that capital C means something in chemistry. It means that it's a kilocalorie. So it's actually 1,000 calories so like if we were thinking about this potato here that's 110 calories, that's actually 110,000 calories. Try telling that to your friends on a diet, right? Hey, don't eat that potato. It's 110,000 calories. Um, that'll really freak them out. But that's essentially what it means, right? A calorie with a capital C is 1,000 calories. Those are the calories we talk about when we're talking about food with a capital C. So our conversion factor, if you were to convert between chemistry calories, right, with a lowercase c, and our food calories with a capital C, that would be 1,000 small c calories in a kilocalorie. But in chemistry, we don't use calories. Actually, the United States is pretty much the only country that uses calories when we're talking about food or in energy in general. The rest of the world uses joules. So like, I studied in London during college and on the bags of chips and on the candy, it says the amount of energy in kilojoules. It doesn't tell you how many calories are in your food. It tells you how many kilojoules are in your food. Isn't that interesting? I never knew that before I traveled. 
Um, but those kilojoules are actually what we use to measure heat flow in chemistry as well, because remember, chemistry is an international language. So James Prescott Joule, this guy here, um, he discovered the joule, and that is our SI unit or a metric unit for heat flow. So heat, just in general, is associated with motion of the particles. The faster the particles are moving, the greater the thermal energy of the substance, therefore the greater the heat, okay? Um, so like I said, our SI unit of energy is the joule. We can convert between calories and joules using this conversion factor. One calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. That's a really handy one to write down. Um, also, one kilojoule is equal to 1,000 joules. We could have figured that out anyways because we know the prefix for kilo, right? But it's handy to have it here. One kilojoule is equal to 1,000 joules. This is the majority of the conversions that we will be doing in this chapter. Converting between calories and joules or converting between joules and kilojoules. Most of the time, we'll measure in joules and kilojoules. You'll only do this calorie conversion every now and again. Um, but again, I just wanted to hit this one more time because it's going to be important as we move forward. The more energy something has, the faster those particles are moving. If the, if the substance cools off, then those particles will move slower. All right, let's look at this practice problem. Methane, which is CH4, this guy, is a major compound in natural gas. It says, using the reaction below, determine the amount of energy produced during its combustion in calories. Okay, do you see, um, this is a combustion reaction, which we'll learn about a little bit later in the course, but do you see now in this reaction, we have some kilojoules over here on the side. Okay, so that's telling you that kilojoules are a product. They're on the right-hand side. They're being produced in this chemical reaction. Therefore, this reaction is exothermic because this has heat on the right-hand side, on the product side. So it's being produced in the reaction. If we had had heat on the left-hand side on the arrow, like some kilojoules over there, then it would be an endothermic reaction because it would be putting in heat to our reaction. So again, we know this is exothermic because the heat is on the right-hand side. All right, let's actually figure out what the problem's asking. This says, determine the amount of energy produced during its combustion in calories. This is the amount of energy that's produced, but it's being produced in kilojoules. So we need to be able to convert the kilojoules into joules. So here are our conversion factors that we know. We know one kilojoule is equal to 1,000 joules, and 4.184 joules is equal to a calorie. So we'll take this here, right, that amount of energy, and we'll put that at the beginning of our train track. We know, based on our rules of train tracks, units always have to cancel down and to the right. So if I have kilojoules there, then that means kilojoules needs to go on the bottom. Our only conversion factor that uses kilojoules is this one. So one kilojoule will go on the bottom, and a thousand joules will go on the top. And then we'll double check, make sure our units cancel, so we know we're doing it correctly. Now we can convert joules to calories using this conversion factor on the top. Remember, joules has to cancel joules, so that 4.184 joules is going to go on the bottom, and one calorie will go on the top. We'll make sure our units cancel, and then we can multiply all the numbers on the top and divide by all the numbers on the bottom. Okay, I've put my answer in both um, regular form and scientific notation, just because sometimes it'll spit it out differently using different calculators. Okay, But this is how we convert from kilojoules to calories, right? These are our conversion factors you're going to want to keep handy. All right, let's talk about specific heat. Anytime we talk about heating something up, we have to talk about specific heat because every substance has a different specific heat capacity, okay? Um, you'll hear me say specific heat and heat capacity. Those are the same thing. The real term is called specific heat capacity but it often gets abbreviated as specific heat or heat capacity, okay? Um, but essentially, the specific heat of a substance is the amount of heat required to change the temperature of one gram of the material by one degree Celsius, or sometimes you'll see it written by one Kelvin. These are the same thing. The Celsius 
um, degree and the Kelvin degree are the same size, so you'll see it written both ways. Um, but essentially, what the specific heat tells us is how easy it is to heat something up. If something has a very low specific heat, like gold, gold has a really, really low specific heat. Essentially, what this means is it, it doesn't take very much energy to heat up the gold. Like, gold will heat up very, very, very quickly. If you apply even a little bit of heat, it rapidly heats up. Whereas water, water has a gigantic specific heat, right? Water is a huge specific heat. So it takes a lot of energy to heat up water, okay? Let's take an example. Let's say we have a pot of water on the stove. We're making some pasta and we are boiling water, okay? Let's say our pot is made out of iron, okay? Think about it real quick. If you're heating up this pot filled with water, which thing heats up first? The pot or the water? Like which one gets hot first? The pot, right? The pot will get a lot hotter, a lot faster than the water does. And usually people think of this is because, well, they're like, okay, well, the pot is the one that's actually touching the burner or touching the fire. That's why it's getting hot faster because it's actually touching the burner. And that's not true. The reason that your pot will heat up faster is because the pot is made out of metal and metals have a very low specific heat. So that means they heat up really, really fast. Water has one of the highest specific heats, which means that our water will absorb a lot of energy before it changes temperature even a little bit. And I like to say that the hungrier you are, right, the longer that seems to take. But the reason for this is that water has such a high specific heat that it takes a ton of energy to change the temperature of the water even a little bit. Okay, so specific heat of water, way higher than most other substances, like really, really, really high. I know it doesn't seem like 4.184 is this big, gigantic number, but it is. Like if we look at this, right, this specific heat is way bigger, right? It's, it's huge. It's almost 40 times bigger than the specific heat of gold. 40 times. That means it's going to take... 40 times more energy to heat up your water than it would to heat up gold. That's crazy, right? Um, but water has a huge specific heat. That means it takes a long time for our water to heat up, but it also takes a long time for our water to cool down, okay? Because it takes a lot of energy moving in order to change the temperature of the water. This is actually why water is used as a coolant in your cars. The water can absorb a ton of energy but change before it changes temperature even a little bit. So it takes a ton of energy for water to heat up and it also takes losing a lot of energy for our water to cool down. All right, so when we are going to heat up our object or cool it down, the amount of energy that's being transferred depends on three different things. The first is the amount of the material. We measure this in mass, which we are going to abbreviate with an M. It also depends on the magnitude of the temperature change. That is delta T. Um, and so in this class and in chemistry in general, anytime you see this triangle, it's not a triangle. It's actually the Greek letter delta. It's a capital delta. And that means change. So delta T means change in temperature. The way that we calculate our change in temperature is we do our final temperature minus our initial temperature. And that's going to be really helpful as we move forward. So it's going to be the difference between them. And then the last thing is the identity of the material gaining or losing energy, right? The reason that this matters is because all of the materials will have a different specific heat capacity. And our specific heat capacity is abbreviated by the letter C. So depending on which material you have, you'll have a different value for C. So here is our equation. Q equals MC delta T, or Q equals M cat, because that triangle kind of looks like an A. Okay, so this will be our equation for energy being lost or energy being gained. So it takes into account the amount of the material, what type of material it is, and the change in temperature. And if we multiply those three numbers together, we can get how much energy is being transferred. 
So Q is going to be heat, and we are going to measure that in joules. Our M is the mass, and that's always going to be in grams. Our C is our specific heat capacity that we've been talking about. The unit for specific heat capacity is joules per gram degree Celsius. I know that looks a little bit silly, but this entire thing is the unit for specific heat capacity. And then lastly, our change in temperature, or our delta T, is going to be in degrees Celsius. So if you have these values, but you have them in a different unit, you'll actually need to convert them into these units before we can do any calculations. They must be in joules, grams, joules per gram degree Celsius, and degrees Celsius before you can do any calculations. All right, let's go ahead and try this out. This one says how much heat is needed to raise the temperature of 200 grams of water by 10 degrees Celsius. So you'll see that it says how much heat. Therefore, we know we are solving for Q. And the only way we've learned to solve for Q so far is Q equals MC delta T. So that's gonna be the equation we use. The way I like to do this is figure out all of our variables first and make sure they're all in the right units. So let's go ahead and do that. We're looking for heat, so that's what we're trying to find, okay? Our mass is 200 grams, so I put that here for mass. And then our C value, you'll notice it doesn't say anything about our C value in this problem. Your C value will always be given to you in a table or in a reference chart, something like that. You do not need to memorize this value for C. It's likely, if you do enough practice problems, that you'll accidentally me memorize the value for water. That's 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. You will use it a lot in these practice problems. So like I said, you'll likely memorize it on accident, but you don't have to. I will always give that to you. And then our change in temperature is our delta T, and it says here we're raising the temperature by 10 degrees Celsius. So we didn't need to do any calculations here. It told us the change in temperature. But if it didn't tell us the change in temperature, then you're just going to calculate the difference between the two, and that will be your value. All right, so now we have all of our variables. We're solving for Q, and we have MC delta T. Normally at this point, we would rearrange our equation to get our variable by itself, but you'll notice it's already rearranged so that Q is by itself. So we don't need to do any rearranging here. We can just plug in our numbers. So if we plug in our numbers, we'll get 200 grams times 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius times our change in temperature, which is 10 degrees Celsius. So just so you know, you can see where all of the units cancel. The grams cancel, the degrees Celsius cancels, and we're left with joules. And so I've written it both ways here, uh, just in case your calculator was showing up differently. All right, let's try another one. This one says, calculate the specific heat. So in this example, we are solving for C, okay? It says uh, specific heat for an unknown. We have 1,638 joules, raises the temperature of 125 grams from 25 degrees Celsius to 52.6 degrees Celsius. All right, like I said, I like to figure out what we have and what we're trying to find to make it as easy as possible. So let's figure out all of our stuff. Again, we're looking for C, so we need to um, identify all of our other variables and figure out what their values are. So we have Q is 1,638 joules. Remember, heat is always measured in joules. We have our 125 grams for our mass, and then we have two temperatures here. Anytime we have two temperatures, you're always going to need to subtract them to figure out the difference. So we did 52 minus 6 minus 25.0, and that gets us a change in temperature of 27.6 degrees Celsius. All right, now we have Q, M, and delta T, and we're trying to solve for C. So we have all of our variables accounted for. Our next step is going to be to rearrange the equation. So I already have it rearranged, but I'm gonna show you how I did it up here. So here's our equation, Q equals M, C, delta T. So what we're trying to do is solve for C. That means we need to rearrange our equation to get C by itself. The way that we do that is we are going to divide by anything we don't want next to C. So we don't want M over there. That's going to cancel out the M's. We also don't want delta T over there. 
that's gonna cancel out the delta t's. So now C is left by itself on that side. So C is equal to Q over M delta T. That's what I have here. C is equal to Q over M delta T. You'll notice I flipped my equation. I do that because I like to have the variable that I'm solving for on the left-hand side. You're welcome to leave it like this with the variable you're solving for on the right-hand side, whichever way makes you happy. Either way, C is equal to Q over M delta T. Now that we have it rearranged, we can go ahead and plug in our numbers. So Q goes on the top, M and delta T go on the bottom, and we'll get our C value, okay? And this C value can actually be used to identify our element, which is kind of cool. So let's say we were doing this as an experiment, we would take our C value and we would compare it to a reference table and it would say, okay, this C value corresponds to this metal. Pretty cool. All right, let's go ahead and get some practice. Please go ahead and complete problems number 13 to 20 on the chapter seven lecture worksheet. Once you're done, come back and we'll keep going. All right, so we use chemistry to study energy changes, right? That's what we've been looking at so far. Um, but a lot of times, we'll actually measure the energy being both lost and gained, right? Remember, the law of conservation of energy says that if something loses energy, it has to be gained by something else. And so we use this whole process uh, to study calorimetry, okay? Um, so here's what our calorimeters look like. Super fancy, right? These are styrofoam cups we've stacked together. And I know that sounds kind of silly, but styrofoam cups are actually really good insulators. That's why we use them to carry hot beverages, right? So by stacking our styrofoam cups and putting a lid on it, we are saying that this is a closed system. And what that means is that all of the energy in this system stays constant. We're not gaining energy, we're not losing energy. All of the energy is going to stay trapped in these styrofoam cups. So these styrofoam cups are going to act as a calorimeter, and they are going to be used to measure the heat that's being either released or absorbed during a chemical or physical process. So we could use these calorimeters to figure out how much heat is being released during a chemical reaction. Pretty cool, right? Um, so the way that it works is we are going to have some water in here, right? That's what we're seeing here. So our styrofoam cups are going to be filled with water and we are going to measure the temperature of the water, okay? So by measuring the temperature of the water, and let's say there's a reaction that's happening in here. If our reaction is exothermic, then our reaction will release heat and it will cause the temperature of the water to go up. If our reaction was endothermic, it would absorb some heat from the water and it would cause the temperature of the water to go down. So we can use the temperature of the water to tell us whether something is exothermic or endothermic. It's pretty cool. So let's take this example. So I made it kind of simple so that we can, you know, just really focus on what's happening. So this is our calorimeter. Okay, we can see that these are our styrofoam cups. And remember inside I said there was some water and then there was something happening in the middle, okay? If it was an endothermic process, that means our substance here is going to absorb energy. Well, where does it absorb energy from? The only place it can absorb energy from is the water. So essentially, it's taking away a bunch of energy from the water because it's absorbing the energy. So when it absorbs the energy, that means our temperature of the water is going to decrease because the water is losing energy, okay? The opposite of tr is true if we have an exothermic process. If the thing that's happening in the middle is exothermic, that means heat is exiting that process. Well, if it's exiting that, that means it's being absorbed by the water. So when the water absorbs energy, that means our temperature of the water increases. So again, we can use the temperature of the water to say whether the process that's happening in the water is exothermic or endothermic. If the water is getting hotter, that means that the process was exothermic. 
if the water is getting colder, that means the process was endothermic. So whenever we use a calorimeter, we have these terms that are called the system and the surrounding. Okay, so in our calorimeter, the surroundings are always going to be the water. Okay, every single time. The system is the reaction that's happening in the middle. Okay, so anytime we're talking about the system, that's our reaction. The surroundings are the water. So essentially, the heat that's being lost or gained by the system, right, by our reaction, is going to be gained or lost from the water, our surroundings. Okay, that's the law of conservation of energy. If something loses energy, it has to be gained by something else. If something gains energy, that means it was lost by something else. So just like we did before, right, we would like to measure okay, well, how much energy is being lost or how much energy is being gained? We are gonna use the same equation, this Q equals MC delta T, to measure how much energy is being transferred through this system. So when we have two objects at different temperatures and they are placed in contact with each other, the heat is going to flow from the material at the high temperature to the material at the low temperature. Okay, remember like earlier I was saying, okay, it's going to go from the fire to the ice cube. Okay, it's always going to go from hot to cold. The heat is going to continue to flow until both materials reach the same final temperature. This is going to be really, really important. When we do these calorimetry calculations, the substances are going to keep changing temperature until they reach the same final temperature. The amount of energy that's going to be lost by the hot thing is going to equal the amount of energy that's being gained by the cold thing, right? Because again, we have the law of conservation of energy. If something is losing heat, then something else is gaining heat, right? All of the energy that's being lost is going to be gained by something else until they reach that same final temperature. So essentially, mathematically, the way this plays out is that all of the energy lost by the hot thing is going to equal the energy gained by the cold thing. So we can set those Q values equal to each other. You'll notice that this is negative here. It's negative because the hot stuff is losing heat, whereas the cold stuff is gaining heat. So we use that negative to represent that the hot substance is losing heat. So we have an equation that we can use with this, right? If their Qs are equal, remember, Q equals mc delta t. So if their Qs are equal, that means that their mc delta t's are equal. So now we have our mc delta t of our hot stuff equals mc delta t of our cold stuff. You'll notice there's still a negative here because remember the energy on the left hand side is from the hot material and that's being lost so that's going to be negative whereas the right hand side is gaining it so it's going to be positive so we can use these calorimeters to measure how much heat is being transferred and do some calculations using that equation on the previous slide let's go ahead and do an example this says a hot piece of metal weighing 350 grams is heated up to 100 degrees Celsius. So we have a really hot piece of metal. And then we're going to place it into a coffee cup calorimeter, right, some styrofoam cups, with some cold water. So again, let's picture this. We have our coffee cups, and then we have a piece of hot metal that we're putting into cold water, okay? And we want to figure out Right? The water, it's going to heat up because the hot metal is being put in there. The metal is going to cool down because it got put into cold water until they reach the same final temperature. The final temperature of the two of them together is 35.2 degrees Celsius. This says, calculate the specific heat of the metal and identify the metal. All right, so we have two different things going on here, right? The metal is hot and it's going to lose energy all of the energy that it's losing is going to be gained by the water in the calorimeter. 
Okay, so anytime we have these two things, right, we have something losing energy and something else gaining energy, we are going to say, okay, all of the energy that's being lost by the hot substance is going to be gained by the cold substance. Therefore, we can set their Qs equal to each other. Remember to put a negative out here for the hot one. All right, well, if their Qs are equal to each other, that means their MC delta Ts are also equal to each other. So we can put those there. Now we're going to go ahead and plug in numbers that we know. Okay, so we have, so like this side, this side is our metal side. Our metal was the thing that was hot, right? And this side was our water side because our water was the thing that was cold. So here's our mass of our metal, 350 grams. We don't know the specific heat of the metal. That's what we're trying to find. So we're going to leave that C as C. And then we'll figure out our change in temperature of the metal, okay? The metal started, oh, sorry. Um, the metal, yes, started at 100 degrees Celsius and it ended up at 35.2. Remember that both of these will have the same final temperature. It's really, really important here that you use delta T as T final minus T initial because the signs here are going to matter. Okay, remember there's a negative out front here. So we have 350 grams, we don't know C, and then our final temperature is 35.2 minus our starting temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. All right, that's all for the metal side. Now let's go to the water side. It says we have 163.2 grams of water. There's our specific heat of water. And then again, we need our change in temperature. Final minus initial. Remember, they have the same final temperature, so that's going to go there again. And then the initial temperature of our water was, was 22.4 degrees Celsius. All right, now we have everything plugged in. We can go ahead and do some math. So essentially what I've done here is I took these, I subtracted these, and you'll get a negative number when you subtract those. So we get our negative number, and then we'll multiply it by negative 350 out here, and that will get us 22,700. And then there's our C that we have left over, okay? On the right-hand side, I've done my subtraction, and then I multiplied all of those numbers together to get 8,740. Once we have that, we can divide both sides by 22,700, and we'll get our value for C. Remember that our units for C are joules per gram degree Celsius. You'll notice here that it left off all of the units, and that's because it just starts to get a little messy. In these calorimetry problems, I typically will take off the units until I write my final answer. Just make sure you add them back in before you write down your final answer because units are very important in chemistry. All right, so if we do this division, we get 0 0.385 joules per gram degree Celsius. And then it also asks to identify our metal. So we go up here, we find 0 0.385, and we see that that corresponds to copper. So this is pretty cool, right? We can actually do this, right? We can heat up a metal, put that metal in some cold water, monitor the temperature change, and we can use that to figure out the identity of the metal. Kind of cool. All right, here is our last type of problem um, and our last practice problem for today. This is going to be two different water samples mixed together, and I want to figure out the final temperature of our water mixture. Some of the water is hot, some of the water is cold, so we know that when we mix them together, we'll get kind of a temperature that's in the middle. But what is that middle temperature? So remember, the hot water is going to lose some energy and transfer it to the cold water. So the hot water will cool down, the cold water will heat up, and they're going to reach some final temperature, and we want to figure out what that is. Okay, so anytime we have heat lost and gained like this, we're going to say, okay, all of the energy that's being lost by the hot thing is going to be gained by the cold thing. In this instance, they're both water. So all of the energy lost by the hot water is going to be gained by the cold water. So we can put, if, we, if their Qs are equal, we can also put their negative MC delta Ts equal as well. Then we can go about filling in some values. Okay, so here's our cold water, 75 grams, 25 degrees Celsius. Here's our hot water, 125 grams, 125 degrees Celsius. 
So I will usually put hot on the left and cold on the right. So we'll get this. There's our mass of our hot water, 4.184, right? That's our specific heat of water. And then our delta T is final minus initial. Remember, we're solving for the final temperature, so we'll just leave that as TF. So that's why we have TF minus our initial temperature. And then the other side, oh, and sorry, and don't forget the negative over here. Very, very important that that left side always has a negative. All right, then on the right-hand side, we have our mass of our cold water, specific heat of our cold water, and then final minus initial. Again, we don't know the final temperature, so I'm going to leave that as TF, but we do know the initial, so I'll fill that in. So this is the trickiest type of problem. You'll notice that we have final temperature in two different places in this problem. That's why it's so tricky, but I'm going to walk you through how to do it, and I recommend that after this lecture is done, try this problem again by yourself and see if you can get the right answer. All right, so once we do this, do you see that we have 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius on each side? We have it here and we have it here. To make our calculations a bit easier, since it shows up on both sides, we can actually cancel this out, which is kind of cool. So that's what I've carried down here. Negative 125 times our TF minus T initial and then 75 minus TF minus T initial. Okay, now I'm going to take this number here and distribute it inside the parentheses along with that negative out front. And I'm gonna do the same with the 75, I'm gonna distribute it inside the parentheses. So that gets us this. Again, make sure to distribute this negative. So when we distribute it here, that made this a positive. All right, so now we get this. So now we need to combine like terms. I'm going to rearrange this by adding 125 TF to both sides to get my TFs together. And then I'm going to add 1900 to both sides to get my real numbers together. So that gets us this. Then we can divide both sides by 200 to get our final temperature. All right, I know that was a lot. This is actually the trickiest problem that I can give you is solving for the final temperature. So like I said, I would recommend doing a few of these practice problems so that you get really, really solid at it. All right, now go ahead and complete problems number 21 to 24 on the chapter seven lecture worksheet. And this is actually the end of today's lecture. I know we covered a ton of ground today and we learned a lot of new things. This is going to take a little bit of studying to help you learn, right? The uh, physical properties that we learned out about at the beginning are all directly related to intermolecular forces. Okay, so being really solid on those intermolecular forces is going to help you to understand those physical properties. Remember, if we have strong intermolecular forces, we're going to have things like low vapor pressures and high melting points, high boiling points, high viscosities, right? Um, whereas a weak intermolecular force will correspond to, you know, like lower vapor pressure and lower melting points, or sorry, higher, higher vapor pressure, lower melting points, lower boiling points, things like that. We then switched gears and we talked about heat transfer, right? We measure heat in chemistry in either joules or kilojoules. And we learned about exothermic and endothermic processes where heat is being lost, that's going to be an exothermic reaction. And when heat is being gained, that's going to be an endothermic reaction. But those don't happen in an isolated environment, right? The law of conservation of energy states that anytime something loses energy, it's going to be gained by something else. And we wrapped all of this up by looking at how to do those calculations using calorimetry, okay? When we have a closed system, like a coffee cup calorimeter, we can say that all of the heat that's being lost by something hot is going to be gained by something cold. And we can use that Q equals MC delta T to do calculations associated with it. So again, I know we covered a lot of ground today. Make sure to do these lecture worksheet problems. They are going to really help you learn the material and get super solid on it. But if you have any questions ever about any of this stuff, please feel free to send them my way. I'm more than happy to help you out and clarify anything that's a little bit fuzzy. 
Remember, I teach chemistry because I like talking about chemistry, and I think this stuff is really neat. So feel free to send me any questions you have. Otherwise, keep working hard, and I will talk to you guys next time.